Hey guys, welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host, broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. If you enjoy the podcast, please take a minute to rate us and don't forget to like and follow along with me on social media as well. So my guest today is Jens Nielsen. Jens, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You are, exactly. All right. So Jens is the principal of Open Doors Capital. Prior to this, he had a successful career in telecommunications and IT, but decided to shift his focus from being an, an employee to being an entrepreneur. In 2016, he started his multifamily journey by purchasing apartments and mobile home parks. And on top of that, Jens also passively invests in real estate. He's passionate about teaching and helping others to achieve the same success. Hey, how are you, Jens? I'm doing great. How are you, Ellie? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, why don't you, you know, tell um, the audience a little bit more about you know, your background and how you got started in real estate? Absolutely. And just like you, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country. I uh, came originally I was born and raised in Denmark, came to the U.S. Uh, 1996. So it's been 24 years now, you know, wow. started, um, started like everybody else, get a job, save a new 401k and just kind of continue that path. Um, and did that for many years and been, you know, relatively successful in that, you know, good money, good, good, good jobs. And, but I also realized every time I wanted to raise, every time I wanted to do anything differently, I had to either find a new job or get a promotion. I didn't really have a lot of control over my mm -hmm. financial destiny. And I also realized, you know, every time there was some sort of downturn in the stock market, I would, you know, just be on the, the losing end of that. Like we've seen here in the last month or two, the same thing. And I was like, this is not, this is a job and it's not really going to create that freedom and, you know, financial uh, abundance that I was really was looking for. So it took me a while to kind of find out what the next step was going to be. And I settled on real estate as, as you know, many other people have done here. And that's, that's, that's kind of a brief overview over my, my path, right. My progress. And um, from that understanding and that mindset, which I think is great because, you know, a lot of people are, were in your position, but were not able to take the step and basically take the risk and become entrepreneurs. And I know it's a hard step to take regardless of, you know, how much money you have or, um, you know, how successful you were in your past job. So how did you go from that step into, um, from taking that step into actually starting investing in real estate? Yeah, I think, you know, we tend to get, we tend to be kind of afraid of the unknown and we revert back to what we're comfortable with and we never really push ourselves out of that comfort zone, right? So I, I had some money saved up and I said, okay, what do I need to know to just get started in real estate? And I connected with some people that uh, I knew had done real estate investing and I said, hey, what is, this, what is this all about? What do I need to do? And they just gave me some very basic ideas of, you know, hey, how do you look at the numbers? How do you analyze a deal and, and just take action? So, you know, me and my spouse, we just bought a couple of uh, fourplexes here, you know, four or five years ago, just to, just to see what it was all about, risking our own money, not really getting other people involved in it. And uh, so I could, I could learn it. And I didn't, you know, a lot of people spend a ton of time studying and reading and never take any action. I was like, hey, I'm committed to this. I know it's the right path. I just went ahead and did it and learned some things. And I've actually recently sold both of those deals again because I was like, it is not this, that is not the, you know, the size of property I want to be in in the long run, but it was a great learning experience. And, you know, so, so just, I think really get some education, but also take action because you can't sit on the, on the sidelines forever. And so that's kind of the initial learning experience I had. Interesting. And today, you know, what kind of assets are you focused on? Yeah, so I'm still definitely a multifamily investor, you know, the value act. Uh, I think a lot of people looking at that class B minus, C, C plus, um, you know, and, and, you know, through the progression of those smaller deals, you know, we went within, the, within a couple of years, we went from, you know, it was four units to 11 to 38 and then to small mobile home parks. So we took, took a lot of action very quickly, just 
by ourselves or with a couple of JV partners to buy some smaller deals and to really learn it before I would go out there and say, hey, I want to syndicate, I want to bring other people's money in because there's a lot of risk around that and then you take on a huge amount of responsibilities. I really wanted to, to learn it um, you know, from the bottom up. And um, so that's what we did, you know, uh, and then started you know, moving into the larger syndication deals here in the last few years. So. Interesting. And so if we're, you know, talking about assets, I want to kind of focus also on asset protection. You know, what have you been doing recently to protect your assets during the COVID-19 recession, which is kind of the, the name I give it to. And I think it's pretty clear that we are in a recession already um, and things are not, you know, I, I think um, we've all as investors, we understood that the last 10 years were very strong and we knew it, was, it wouldn't be sustainable, but nobody saw this, maybe, maybe besides, you know, Bill Gates, nobody really saw this coming. So, you know, what are you doing today to protect your assets? Yeah, and then you're talking about Bill Gates. He was on a, a TEDx or a mm -hmm. call that was very interesting. But that's a different story, and maybe people should go and listen to that. And uh, uh, so, anyway, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when we booked this call here a month ago or more, we, you know, things weren't the way they are now. So it's just how, how crazy things can change in a short period of time. But really, what we have done very quickly is first of all uh, communicate with the investor sorry with the with the tenants and say hey yes maybe you know rent is still due on the first and we're here in early april rent is still due on the first if you have problems paying your rent let us know and we will work with you so just kind of create that we kind of in this together you know let's let's talk about it let's communicate and let make sure that that everybody is, is on the same page here. Because you hear all these stories about, well, there's rent holiday, you don't have to pay rent. And, and I didn't know, I wanna make sure that tenants understood that if you still have a job, you still have to pay rent. Even if you don't have a job, you still have to pay rent, but let's work with you. That was the kind of the first thing. And then we also put in a, uh, in our mobile home park that we have here locally, we put in a little, hey, whomever pays rent on time, you get put into a drawing for a gift card. It's a little bit of incentive to maybe, you know, get out there and pay rent. And it's gone pretty well. We actually had one, one person who said, oh, can I have rent forgiveness? And, he, and I said, no, not really. I mean, we can work on, 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 uh, on a payment plan. And he's like, oh, well, I'll pay it on Monday. And so, okay, so, <laughs> you know, I think some people may be pushing, see if they can take advantage of it. So that's on the tenant side and really figuring out how everybody's working and be proactive. So my, you know, my property managers was out there reaching out to them in advance and just seeing what can be expected. And here in the next week, we'll kind of show where we're at, right? Um, from an investor standpoint, we've been communicating with them. We basically said, hey, we probably have to hold back distributions for a little while here to make sure we have reserves. We're going to stop any kind of major CapEx work so we don't deplete all our reserves in case our income goes down, right? So there's some money to pay the debt and so forth. We haven't gone and done, asked for any forbearance in our mortgage and everything else so far, because I really think that that's a, comes with a bunch of strings attached that I'm not willing to that's really right. <laughs> accept right now. So, um, you know, and then just really, you know, just hunkering down, don't, not, don't spend money on things we don't have to do, right? Just really focus on the key stuff, get the income in and then try to pay, pay the bills that we have to pay and just kind of see how it goes in the next, next month or two, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, all, all the, the um, tactics that you've discussed right now um, that can help you protect your assets, um, I, th these are all, all, all those things we've implemented in our properties as well. And I think it's interesting how the dialogue between us as owners and the tenants just shifted overnight. When, I mean, we, we never went to them and said, can you pay? If you cannot, let's work, let's, you know, let's work together to make it happen. Um, partially because eviction was you know, pretty much, you know, a pretty easy and inexpensive process. If someone doesn't pay, you know, they get evicted. And now it's the, you know, you cannot evict if you have a uh, agency, an agency debt on your property, regardless of uh, whether the tenant actually lost their job, you just can't evict them at this point. Yeah. And on a moral level, you know, do you really want to evict someone who is sick or just lost their job? Um, so there's a lot, you know, a lot going on. Um, do you think that 
you would change anything in the way you see asset protection moving forward now that we know how exposed we might be for future you know pandemics definitely around reserves making sure you have enough reserves so you can cover six 12 months worth of uh mortgage payments right uh, have that uh, just be really strong on that and i think there's there's been some deals that have been made recently where it was like yeah we can just about close it and we have a little bit of money in the bank but not a whole lot because there's that idea of really just getting blue skies in front of us right so so i think that having those reserves and i know some um, property managers are moving to more of a um, to instead of taking security deposits, doing like um, insurance on the buy renter insurance, not insurance on the income essentially. So you as the owner protect yourself for lost income and so forth. It's not something I've looked into a whole bunch, but I know my my property managers have. So that may be an opportunity in the future. And said, hey, if this tenant can't pay, can we insure ourselves for some of that? Right. Um, and I think also, you know, that rosy view we've had that rents are going to continue go, to go up at two to four, whatever many percent, that may be something we have to adjust very quickly and say that may not be the case in the near future. Um, and just be, be aware of that and, and be, you know, just make sure when you underwrite deals that you can really s survive a 20, 30% economic vacancy, right? Uh, and not just, <laughs> and it's been easy, you know, as you said, the last 10 years we've been in this expansion, it's been easy to think that everybody's going to continue the same way. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about process now that we've, you know, covered the assets part of uh, our show today. When it comes to the process, um, you have a very robust system when it comes to syndication, to syndicating multifamily properties. Can you talk to me a little bit about that system that, that you've built? Yeah, so I think I, I really feel strongly around teams. So having a team in place to take care of all of the different aspects. I think many real estate investors want to go out there and do it by themselves because that's can be an individual thing especially if you buy a smaller property once you start syndicating you have to have that process in place right so what we have found you know giving my background being in the it field i've found that i have people on my team that are really good at reaching out to the brokers and the sellers and negotiate with them and coming up with the you know the purchase and sales agreement and so forth and i spend a bunch of time in the background right just setting up the system so it's like how do we when we get a deal what's the process for analyzing it right who you know what are the the data we need in order to put it into us to our analyzer how do we put to push that through that process and we use um you know various tools like slack for you know communicating because we have the geographically dispersed we use you know trello or some of those kind of process management tools to move stuff through the process as we work on them. So those are some of the things that I really felt like the real estate world were missing from the IT world, right? We're so good at processes and systems and stuff like that. And I think a lot of syndications were just kind of done by luck and, <laughs> and, and random <laughs> actions, whereas we try to be very much, much more like, hey, this is how we process a deal. We have some you know, junior underwriters that look at it first. And if they feel like it's a good deal, we then move on and then see if we can can take that. So so that's really key. And then when we start the whole, you know, the whole raising money and stuff, you know, we use platforms for people to register on to indicate their investment interest and, and, and do that. And then as we communicate, then we use those tools as well to communicate with them. So it's just I like to do it the same way every time. So I don't have to reinvent some something that I've done before. Right. So that's really a that's key in that whole putting those deals together. How, how expensive is it to use all the tools that you're using? If someone is saying, okay, you know what, Jens, that's great. I want to build that system. I'm going to look into, you know, break down the entire process and know who's doing what and when, and I'm going to use systems to help me automate the process. How much money are we talking about roughly? A lot of those tools actually like Slack and Trello and those, those are free for them when you start up, you know, you can have so many free messages on there and so many different tasks. So there's a lot of tools out there that if you start out using them, they don't cost a lot. And then beyond that, it could be something, you know, 20 to $50 per user per month or something. So 
it's not going to break the bank to do any of those tools. And especially, you know, right now we're all working remotely, right? So being, excuse me, having those tools in place is even more important. So that, I don't think that, that cost and that is going to break the bank. Then our, our investor platform, the one we use is, is fairly reasonable. It depends on how many deals you have. And it's, it doesn't cost a ton of money. You know, it's definitely worth it for the, um, for the automation and those tools you get there. So there's so many things out there that you can use that doesn't cost a ton of money. You know, so. All right. Well, that's great. Um, what are the best tips that you have for someone that wants to build a solid syndication system? So the way that we did, and I'll actually be happy to share that with your listeners is create like a checklist. And I think it has 50 or 75 items on there with all the different steps that I feel like you need to do in a syndication, everything from connecting with brokers all the way down to actually disposing of the asset. So we have like checklist items in there and it's basically just starting the, the thought process and a conversation. Oh, here are all the things I need to do. And then you can like say, okay, who do I have on my team that can, that can do these tasks. And if you don't, if you're missing team members, you can then fill in either, you hire somebody to do it or you partner with, with somebody else. So that's really a, the starting point, you know, the checklist of all the steps. And, and that's something we put together, but as I mentioned, you know, we put in your show notes or something to share that list. So. That's a great tip. And I think it, it makes the entire process a lot easier because one might think, you know, how do I start building a system? Sometimes the, the word system is, is a little bit scary. Um, but you, you, I, I think it's a really Great tip because you just broke it down into a very simple, you know, you know, very simple tasks. Just write down everything you need to do and then build basically your system around it. So you understand what basically what tools and uh, websites and, and, and employees or partners should be involved in each step. I think it's a really, really good way of simplifying, you know, creating something that could look a bit more complicated which is the syndication process that's right yeah and it's like anything we do right you know you, you make you build i mean you make a cake or recipe or something like that you have some steps you got to follow to get to yeah. the outcome right and i think if we try to reinvent it every time we don't get the same result and we get frustrated and we you know just it doesn't work quite well so i think that's and that's where i think i've added the most value to the teams i'm on right is just going in there and help with some of all these processes and really get that built out so we don't have to guess every time yeah absolutely well let's let's um talk a little bit about strategy so we're recording this today is april 6th so it's kind of the the first six days after the um collections of the april month because collections in march were you know, pretty, should be pretty normal. Um, people, basically tenants paid um, for March earlier than, you know, that than the, basically the time that we actually realized that something really big is, is happening in the world. Um, so having said that, you know, I know that some sponsors around me are thinking that they might be changing their strategy. Um, and, and I hear many opinions about it. Will you change your strategy in, you know, in light of the current recession in a short term or in a long term? So we are in the middle of, <laughs> we're in the middle of a deal that we kind of, you know, got on a contract there in the beginning of late February, beginning of March. And we're like, oh, everything looks good. And we underwrote it and stuff. And then all this stuff happened, right? So we immediately had to, I mean, we couldn't get, you know, uh, third party inspections done. So we're like, well, we came a little bit to a screeching halt here in that process, right? Because we have the money committed, we have everything, but we just can't really move forward, right? So the strategy is immediately, hey, lucky the sellers, he understands what's going on. So we're just putting that on a pause for, for a few months, other things maybe more normalized a little bit, right? Uh, I think really the other strategy is it's been, you know, lending is another challenge right now. I think, you know, uh, we may have to look at raising more money for reserves because I see, you know, the agency lenders are, hey, maybe it's 12 or 18 months worth of uh, capital. You have to sit in a, you know, reserves in a bank in order to even get uh, approved for a loan. So raising a little bit of money and also probably dialing back our, our rent um, growth projections. 
luckily some of our markets are very tertiary and we've never said more than like one or two percent rent growth which is pretty much just following following um inflation um but you know it could be that we you know our value add strategy you know may not we may not be able to raise the rent quite as much as we had hoped during those those uh, those additions so we have to look back and just say okay if we we may just one of the things is well maybe we'll just upgrade a few units here in you know summer fall and just see what we can do in terms of that and maybe not just plan that that we can really achieve those rent growth depending on how quickly employment goes back to normal and people's income what happens with that right um i'm not really you know it's a really difficult time to understand if you should put offers in to buy anything right now because That's you right. don't know when you can close you don't really know what it's going to look like so there's too many uncertain i think there is going to be you know cap rates are probably going to expand a little bit here in the near future and i don't want to buy on something what it did in the first quarter of 2020 we're in the second and third quarter maybe fourth quarter will be significantly less right so a little bit of a just pause for a minute you know make sure we our current deals will continue to to perform and then we'll just have to, to wait a minute and see what what happens next right so i think that's like a lot of other people we don't really know what's going to happen so sometimes the best thing is to do nothing right yeah that's fair enough and it's pretty pretty conservative i think before receiving financial information about any you know any property for may and and you know april you can't really know what you're buying. You don't, you know, and especially since, like you said, we don't know when it's going to end. Um, so I think there's still deals that could be, you know, that, that you can find out there. But the question is, how do you know that there are actually de good deals if you don't know what the true situation is? And we can only know that um, pretty much, you know, the next, I would say, at least 60 days, if, if not more. Um, yeah, so strategy is definitely something that I think uh, we will probably change in, in the near future or at least look at and, and re-examine um, pretty, um, pretty soon. Well, Jens, thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing your knowledge. Um, we uh, have arrived to the lightning round questions. Are you ready? Absolutely. Let's do this. All right. So, Jens, what's your favorite hobby? Uh, cycling. I live in the mountains of Colorado and I... Just and this one thing I've been able to do during this crisis, I can still go and ride my bike by myself. So, <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? Um, people listen to the podcast. Probably, I was a professional. Uh, I was a, I was a professional mountain bike racer for like ten years out of my life. So, oh wow. <laughs> what's more fun, doing this or buying apartments? <laughs> I buy apartments so I can ride my bike more, right? <laughs> that's true that's true um what do you wish you had known when you uh, just started out in real estate just the idea of building a team i kept hearing people talking about the team i didn't really understand what it meant now it's like oh yeah the team is really a key thing so building a team and starting a little bit bigger i think luckily i didn't start in single mm. family i started multiple just build a team and start bigger and that's what i'm telling people to do these days awesome so uh, what's your number one advice for someone who wants to scale their business and maybe that you just answered it yeah i mean it's two things like systems right yeah. build a system before you that's kind of the foundation of everything and then the, uh, the other thing is like find somebody you can work with on a team and, and just start bigger that, that's really i mean not saying you should buy a 200 unit but maybe a 20 or 30 unit building mm -hmm. that would be my advice there Awesome. Well, Jens, um, if any of our listeners want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Yeah, so my website is opendoorscapital.com. Um, and if anybody want to get on a call with me, they can go to opendoorscapital.com slash call. And I, I book, you know, a 15, 20 minute call with anybody who's interested in talking to me about real estate, cycling, coaxing, whatever they <laughs> say. <so. laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate it.